Okay, now in, uh, we're sneaking up on Lamentations, that's what we're doing. And in, in preparation for actually looking at the text of Lamentations, we've been taking a chronological look at the, God's relationship with Israel up to the great day of punishment that is mourned in the book of Lamentations, up to the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem that occurred in 587, 586 B.C., and I'm belaboring the point in the hope that you'll grasp in a, in a deep way how clearly and repeatedly God expressed himself and that you'll see how patient he was in the face of almost constant rebellion. I mean, God could not have been clearer in saying to the Israelites, this is the path of blessing, this is the path of curse, if you are faithful to me, you'll be blessed. If you rebel against me, you'll be cursed. I want you to be blessed. Remember this. Teach it to your children. Keep it fresh in your mind. It is the key to life and blessing. And then we see what happens to them. They constantly rebel against God. During the uh, exodus and the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the Israelites grumbled and complained. They rebelled against God. They engaged in idolatry. God had stressed repeatedly to the Israelites that they would be blessed and secure in the promised land if they were faithful to him, that they would be brutalized and exiled by a foreign invader if they were unfaithful to him. And they go into the promised land, and as we, we looked at, you see, for the roughly 315 years of the book of Judges, we see that they constantly are rebelling against God. They wind up uh, engaging in idolatry. They engage in other abominations throughout that period of time, despite what God had said to them. And then we have the kings that arise, and the kings included many individuals who helped lead the people of Israel astray. The United Kingdom of Israel, as you know, you had a United Kingdom, and after Solomon's death, the kingdom divides, where you have the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, and we're just focusing on the southern kingdom because that's where Jerusalem is. That's the subject of the book of Lamentations. But I'd made the point that all of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel, they were bad. But as we look at the, at the kings in the southern kingdom, you see many who are involved in uh, idolatry and leading the people astray. And even when we have the relatively few kings, oftentimes you have the people are continuing <clears throat> to offer sacrifices to idols and to do that to do that kind of thing, we went from you have you have Solomon who in his in his uh, older age turned against God. He went to uh, into idolatry from Rehoboam his son, and we went and looked at all the kings. And then last week near the end, we were talking about Manasseh, who was Manasseh was a, a wicked king. He ruled in in Judah from 696 to 642 the first 11 years of which it was a co-regency with his father Hezekiah, but he did great evil. I mean, here we have a king who's worshiping pagan gods. He erected altars to idols and images of idols in the temple and in the courts. And you just imagine this, you know, the place that God had said, this is a special manifestation of my presence. He puts the idols there. And the altars, he puts them in the temple courts. He burns his son as an offering. He's involved in what we would call the occult, and he shed much innocent blood. Now, this is a bad dude. You know, this is somebody that, you know, I mean, he'd get like five stars as a pagan king. And here he is, you know, leading uh, God's people. He was somebody who, who caused much problem. He did and led the people to do more evil than the nations that God had removed from the promised land. So that's bad. You remember the Amorites said, these people, you know, their sin is reaching its, its fulfillment. They're going to be vomited out. That's what's going to happen to you if you act this way. And here we have Manasseh. And then his son Ammon, who reigns in Judah for two years, he carries on his legacy of apostasy and evil. So we have this long reign of Manasseh where we have a person who's <clears throat> in complete rebellion to God, sacrificing his son, worshiping idols, bringing them into the temple, into the temple courts. We have his son who carries it on, and then we have Josiah. And when we ended, I was talking about Josiah, and that's where I wanted to pick back up. Josiah is eight years old when he begins to reign. This is in 640 B.C. 
when Josiah comes to the throne and he reigns for 31 years in Jerusalem, he's a good king. And it's during the 18th year of his reign that the high priest Hilkiah reports to him the finding in the temple of the book of the law, which is probably the book of Deuteronomy. And you say, well, how in the world could it have gotten lost? Well, it had been placed next to the Ark of the Covenant. You see that in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 26. And presumably, during this long reign of Manasseh, when you've got a guy who has nothing to do with God, who's creating you know, altars and idols in the temple, apparently it kind of got taken away. Because who wanted that? And so it got taken away, presumably, and forgotten about. Well, when Shapin, the secretary, read the book, in, I, in Josiah's presence, Josiah, he's deeply convicted. This is, this is what's meant when it says he tears his clothes. And in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 13, he commanded Hilkiah and others, says, go, go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. And so he says, he hears this and he's freaking out because he says, this is so clear and obvious and we have lived in rebellion of it. We got to be on the cusp of getting smoked. You see, this is, so he says, go and inquire of the Lord and find out. So the answer to his inquiry, the response comes through the prophetess Huldah. And you read in 2 Kings 22, verses 15 to 20, it says, And she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants, all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me, and have made offerings to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse... And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. So God says, I'm bringing the judgment that I have said I would do, urged people over and over and over to repent, but you will die before I do that. So your eyes will not see this. Well, Josiah, he embarked on a program of religious reform, but that was insufficient to stave off God's judgment. The people would not react strongly enough, significantly enough, and so it was insufficient to do that. Now, God first spoke to the prophet Jeremiah in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. You see that in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 2. So around 627, Josiah comes to the throne in 640. Jeremiah first speaks around 627, five years before the book of the law was found. And most of Jeremiah's written prophecies, they concern events after Josiah's death. Josiah dies in 609. And most of Jeremiah's written prophecies concern events after his death in 609 and before the destruction of Jerusalem in 587. So we're looking at, you know, a 22, 23 year span in there when you have most of Jeremiah's written prophecies. He warns the people during that time, the people of Judah, he warns them repeatedly of the terrible judgment that God is going to bring. He's telling them. He warns them about that, and even now he seems to give that, that there's some hope if they would repent. Even now. You know, I've often thought about prophecies to me. They're, they a lot of times are like, uh, you know, a Christmas carol where you have the, he, he sees the vision in the future, and he wants to know, are these things that must be, or are these things that I can change? And see, that's how often prophecy is, is that God is saying it is incentive to repent, that here is what I'm going to do. 
But if you repent, then we'll see. You see? So anyway, he, you see in Jeremiah, it seems that even then, if the people would repent, that there would be hope. For example, Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 8 to 17, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, even so will I spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that, there might, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory, but they would not listen. I made them to be a glory, a people, a name, a glory for me, but how did they treat me? They would not listen. When God speaks, we have to listen. We have to listen to what he says. But he says, they would not listen. You shall speak to them this word. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every jar shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, do we not indeed know that every jar will be filled with wine? Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I will fill with drunkenness all the inhabitants of this land, the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will dash them one against another, fathers and sons together, declares the Lord, I will not pity or spare or have compassion that I should not destroy them. Now that's something. You see, you hear God saying, I will not pity nor, or spare or have compassion that I should not destroy them. The time has come. <laughs> you see, you have filled the cup. I am the most patient of gods. But you have filled the cup. And the time has come. And even then, you'll see what Jer Jeremiah says here in Give Ear. He continues in verse 15. Be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness. Before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and makes it deep darkness. But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears. Because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. So you see in Jeremiah, as he... As he delivers the prophecy, his hope, his desire is that in doing so, the people will repent and God will even then relent. But he says, if you will not, it's nothing but tears and sorrow because the flock of Israel, God's people have gone and have become captive. Well, Jeremiah also makes clear that God won't extinguish Israel, that he will not wipe Israel from the face of the earth. But in keeping with what God had said in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 40 to 46, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29 to 31. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 5. He will bring them back to the land after a period of exile. So God had, had said those things. He had said, you have to be faithful, you're going to be cursed. But he had sprinkled in there a promise that there will be repentance and Israel will not be extinguished. I will bring back to the land those who have learned and who come back. And see, it's trust in God's faithfulness to that promise, as I've said a number of times. It is that specific promise of God in the Old Testament that gives them a ray of hope. As they're being punished in exile, they can turn to that promise and say, He is faithful, so I can have hope that there will be a return. And it's because He has said that. Now, after Josiah was killed at Megiddo, in 609 B.C., his son Shalom, and this is why they have names and then they have throne names. So his son Shalom, whose throne name is Jehoahaz, he reigns for three months. And the verdict on him in 2 Kings 23 is Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. Now Jeremiah is preaching... And what's the word here? Well, this guy, what's he do? He did what was evil. Okay, he, he, now Pharaoh Necho, so this is, you have Jehoahaz comes to the throne in 609, and Pharaoh Necho, he replaces Jehoahaz, because at that time in 609, Egypt was controlling Palestine. So he comes and he boots Jehoahaz, and he replaces Jehoahaz with another of Josiah's sons, 
a son named Eliakim, and he gives him the throne name Jehoiakim. You see, the king likes to put his man on the throne. He puts his guy on there. This guy's beholden to the king, and it makes things easier. So that's what happens. So you have Pharaoh boots Jehoahaz, and he puts, he puts on the throne Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim reigned from 609 to 598. So he's reigning for about 11 years in there. Okay, so he's, he's there, and it says, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zib- Zibidah, the daughter of Padiah of Ruma, And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. So the Babylonians now, the Babylonians, they're on the rise, and by 605, they gain control of Palestine. So you have this king who was installed by an Egyptian because he wanted him to be owe him and to be his buddy. Well, the Babylonians, that's in 609, he reigns from 609 to 598. The Babylonians by 605 now are the dukes of the region, control that particular area. So that means that this king now becomes their vassal, their their person who has to kowtow to them or they'll come and take him out. So you have a shift in allegiance. Where, so the Babylonians now are controlling uh, this particular king. And so wh- what happens, you wind up having, they take control, and then Jehoiakim rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. So this, this king who's been installed by the Pharaoh, he comes in and now he owes loyalty to the Babylonian king. But what's he do? He rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. And this leads to an assault against Judah by Nebuchadnezzar in 598, 597. Not the destruction time yet. That's 587. We're about a decade earlier. So you have another assault on Judah in 598. And Jehoiakim, he causes the trouble and he promptly dies. So he brings the assault. He winds up dying and he's succeeded on the throne by his son, Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim, and then he is succeeded by his son, son Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim, he serves only three months, and he promptly forks the kingdom over. He surrenders without a fight. Jehoiakim does, in order to spare Jerusalem from complete annihilation in 598, 597. So he is then taken into captivity. This king, Jehoiakim, who comes to the throne just three months, surrenders after the Babylonian assault in 598, He surrenders, doesn't want Jerusalem to be destroyed. He's taken into captivity with the royal family and with a large portion of the Judean elite, including the prophet Ezekiel. 598, they get carted off into Babylonian captivity, and more treasures from the temple and the royal palace are carried off. Now Jehoiakim, he, he, he he fares well in captivity. This king Jehoiakim, who comes to the throne, surrenders, and gets carts off, carted off. He fa- fares well. He's freed after 37 years of captivity. When evil Merodach succeeds Nebuchadnezzar as the Babylonian ruler, and he enjoyed favor with the king. Now, despite this exile, this is important because despite the exile, as traumatic as the exile of 587, 586, and you even have 598, 597, even before then, you had 605 when he took some people like Daniel. Okay, Daniel and his companions. But despite the exile of of Judah, the prophets never lost hope in the continuation of David's line. And the linchpin in that is Jehoiakim. That king who surrendered, who was taken into Babylonian captivity, fared well, is freed after 37 years. He's the linchpin of the continuation of, of David's line. This is the Jeconiah who's listed in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. You see, so that's just a little footnote that, that he goes off, but he's important for the Davidic promise, and despite the exile, they never lost hope, because remember what God said, a descendant of David is going to rule on the throne forever. And so he's, he's a, a, an important point in that. 2 Kings 24, 8 through 12 says, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. You know what that is, right? You've got a fortified wall, and you're all closed in. You say, you know, who can get me? 
Well, they simply surround the place. And they said, watch. <laughs> you know, and time goes on, and the food runs out, and all of this. So then they also have different weapons of war that they use, siege ramps and towers, and, you know, mankind is always uh, technologically innovative when it comes to war. And so they got, they got their ways of, of assaulting, but this is what this is. You're, you're locked up in there, trapped in there. So they wind up, they, bes they besiege the city. They besiege the city. So at that time, servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon, himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials. Now, Ezekiel was carted off and in captivity from 598, 598, 97, down to 587, 586 during that period of time. Ezekiel is prophesying in captivity. He repeatedly is warning them of the severe judgment that is about to befall Jerusalem. You've read Ezekiel. We've studied Ezekiel. He's telling them. Nightmare. He has all these acted out things that he does. Letting them see this is what is in store for the city. Then after taking Jehoiakim captive... What does Nebuchadnezzar do? This is 598. He takes Jehoiakim captive. He installs his man on the throne. He thought this was his man because this guy had been put on, the first guy had been put on there by an Egyptian. Okay, he was pretty, he, he thought he was cool. So he's going to keep him there. He rebels. Here he comes in 598. This guy goes, you know, not, not Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim. He takes him captive. And now he puts his man on the throne. He puts, he puts uh, Josiah's son You'll never remember these names, but just, just get the idea. He, he, Josiah's son, who's going to be, he's the king that he just carted out Jehoiakim's uncle, is Madaniah. Okay, Madaniah, and he becomes a puppet king in Jerusalem, but he gets the throne name Zedekiah. All right, so 598, 597, Nebuchadnezzar puts his man Zedekiah on the throne. And you, know, you can see how this is. You know, he sits here and says, listen, uh, you're going to rule. I'm going to, you know, I want you to, do, you have certain duties to me. I want you to be loyal and you do this and that and it'll be good. And you don't. And, uh, okay. So th that's the setup. And what happens with this king? Well, after a number of years, Zedekiah initiates a rebellion against the Babylonians. And you can imagine what happens. You know, here's the king of Babylon and he has taken captive this one king Rather than annihilate the city in 598, and they said, this guy, he, he comes in for three months and says, I give you the city. You know, okay, well, no, 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 okay, I surrender, here's the city. He says, okay, you, I'm carting you off, and I'm putting my man on here. Now, here's what I expect, and then he rebels. Well, see, there are all kinds of things at work here. It is like the dignity of the king. The king, the human king is not going to be treated this way. And so he comes in, this, is a, you know, this triggers a furious retaliation, and this is what culminated in the destruction of Jerusalem in 587, 586. Nebuchadnezzar comes, destroys the city, following a two-year siege of the city. You can imagine what's going on in the city for two years when it's sealed off. There's no food in there. You can just imagine what it's like, and that's what we'll see as we read in Lamentation. Well, that's the event that is mourned in the book of Lamentation. 2 Kings 24, 18 and 19, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Nibla, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done. 2 Chronicles 36, 12 to 16 says, He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear by God. And you see, this is what the king would do. When the king would come and install him on the throne, he would make him swear in the name of Yahweh that he would be loyal to him. And so... He says, well, this is what he's saying. This, this person said that, and he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. He says, he also rebelled against the king of Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear by God. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord, the God of Israel. All the officers of the priests and the people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful. 
following all the abominations of the nations, and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place, but they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. That's it. That's what brings on. So we have, we have Josiah as a bright spot all the way down, starting with the insanity of Manasseh. We get Josiah, and then what do we get? Evil, evil, evil. Ignore the prophets, ignore the prophets. And then God, that's it. There's no remedy. The cup is full, the time has come. Destruction as promised is now coming to you. What I have told you all along, pleaded with you, laid it out for you, instructed you. And here it is. That's the destruction. So when we read in Lamentations, the mourning of what has happened, understand all of this. Okay? That's why I went through it. As I said, I belabored it, but it had an impact on me and I wanted to share it with you. Now the fall of Jerusalem is reported in Scripture in 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 1 to 21. I mean, 1, 1 to 21, 2 Chronicles 36, 17 to 21, Jeremiah 39, 1 to 10, and Jeremiah 52, 1 to 30. I want to read to you the account, if you'll indulge me, the account in 2 Kings chapter 25. It says, in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls by the king's garden. Though the Chaldeans, another name for the Babylonians, though the Chaldeans were around the city. And they went in the direction of the Arabah, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah. <clears throat> so we have Nebuchadnezzar himself staying in Riblah. And here we have this, we have the king, Zedekiah, who had been installed by Nebuchadnezzar, who had said he would not rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, who had rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, and now was in Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And it says, he says, uh, <clears throat> the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, <clears throat> and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. You see, what did they do? They wanted him to watch the slaughter of his children. Then they blind him. So that'll be the last thing he saw. Then they take him into captivity. This didn't turn out too well, did it? This is just, this is just see, the, the, uh, a foretaste. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem, every great house he burned down. Can you imagine this? The temple of God being burned to the ground. This is the temple that when the Assyrians assaulted in 701 with Hezekiah, God smoked 185,000 Assyrians. God could have certainly stopped that. But this was God doing it. This is God doing it through the instrumentality of the Babylonians. This is his judgment. And so they burned down they, and burned the house of the Lord, the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, together with the rest of the multitude, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. 
But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. And the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord, and the stands in the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the dishes for incense and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service, the fire pans also and the bowls. What was gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold. What was silver is silver. As for the two pillars, the one sea and the stands and the stands that Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these vessels was beyond weight. The height of the one pillar was 18 cubits, and on it was a capital of bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits, a latticework and pomegranates. All of bronze were all around the capital. And the second pillar had the same with the latticework. And the captain of the guard took Sariah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold. And from the city he took an officer who had been in command of the men of war, and five men of the king's council who were found in the city, And the secretary of the commander of the army who mustered the people of the land. And 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the city. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land. And one of the things, see, for us to grasp is the identification of the people of Israel with the land. You see, this idea that this was the land God had given them. This was God's gift to them. And then with the temple, God's presence there in the temple. You know, it's hard for us to get it. it would, you know, I was trying to think of what would be a parallel. It have something like, you know, if you're hanging out in the rubble of Washington, D.C. You see, something about the, the idea of the center or the expression of the nation. You see, some great city that... that captured, this is our life and our country and our city taken from them. And you have to see something of that, the emotion of that, to understand what's going on. Cities had been taken, war had gone on, but this is particularly devastating for the people of Israel. I wanted to uh, remind you just of a couple of things archaeologically that we had talked about when we did the the study of the archaeology in the Bible. You know, when Nebuchadnezzar is coming... During this assault, after you had Zedekiah rebel against him, and now we have Nebuchadnezzar coming back in 587, 586, or earlier than that when he's, his campaign is going. And we have some, to me, interesting archaeological artifacts from that. Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 7, it refers to Nebuchadnezzar's final campaign against Judah, and it mentions that Lachish and Ezekiah, were the only fortified cities in Judea other than Jerusalem that were still holding out against Nebuchadnezzar's assault. So we have Jeremiah saying, here are these two fortified cities that remain, Lachish and Ezekiah. And Ezekiah is about 18 miles southwest of Jerusalem. Lachish is 11 miles south of Ezekiah. And in 1935, 1938... We had, discovered, uh, we had discovered in Lachish by a man named Starkey in the ruins there, ostraca, which are just, it's a name for broken pieces of pottery. They find these ostraca, you see, there they are. And they're broken pieces of pottery. On some of these, you have messages that had been written during the time of Jeremiah 34, verse 7, when Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's army is advancing on Jerusalem. Now, most of the Lachish letters, they appear to be dispatches from a Jewish subordinate named Hoshia to someone, uh, who, to the commander who's at, named Yaush in Lachish. There's some debate about his location, but it seems to be he's in Lachish, and you're getting Hoshia is communicating with him in this way by writing on these pieces of pottery. And so he, he apparently, Hoshia is apparently stationed at an outpost that was responsible for interpreting the fire signals from Ezekiel and Lachish during that time. During the assault, there must have been some way of communicating so we can have some idea. And one of them, Ostrakhan 4, it says, And let my Lord know that we are watching for the signals of Lachish according to all the indications which my Lord hath given, for we do not see Ezekiel. And so just to me, I, I don't know how this strikes you. I always like this stuff that you can just kind of go back and actually see the, you know, this was real stuff. These are real events. It's just not, you know, uh, well, it's just pages. No, these people lived through this. And here are the people right at the time writing 
about the advance of Nebuchadnezzar on Jerusalem. The Babylonian prism, 2 Kings 25, and, and a number of chapters in Jeremiah, they mention Nebuzaradan as the captain of the Babylonian guard. Well, there was a prism found in Babylon that was published in 1938 that lists Nebuzaradan as a member of Nebuchadnezzar's court. So here we have the Bible giving us the name of this character, that he's somebody, an official of Nebuchadnezzar's, and we find over here this Babylonian prism that in fact confirms and lists this same individual as being somebody in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's service. I didn't have a, a picture of that. Last one on the archaeological thing. In Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 3, it's best translated as saying that Nebo Sarsakim, you can see that's how it's translated in the NIV, the TNIV, the New English translation. Nebo Sarsakim, a chief officer of Nebuchadnezzar, was present at the fall of Jerusalem. So here we have this person, this individual, that Scripture says he was there when Jerusalem fell. Okay? And then in 2007, Michael Jersa, who was an associate professor at the University of Vienna, he was searching the, uh, the British Museum for Babylonian financial accounts. This is what these kinds of people do, you see. <laughs> he was going through all the old things that they had, and he's looking for financial records from the ancient, ancient empire of Babylon. And he deciphers this cuneiform script. There's the little tablet. On this little tablet, it was discovered in the 1870s, acquired by the British Museum in 1920s. This guy's going through them in 2007, and it's a receipt that's dated to the 10th year of Nebuchadnezzar, which makes it 595 B.C., and this receipts for a gift of gold that was made to the temple in Babylon, which is uh, located uh, near Baghdad. The donor on the receipt is Nebo Sarsakim, Nebuchadnezzar's chief eunuch. So here we have the same, you know, we have this guy mentioned, he's present, and then we have, here he is, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, chief eunuch. So we, I, you know, this, this is history. This happened to these people. They endured what we're going to be looking at. Okay, uh, six minutes to finish the introduction, and then next week, Lord willing, we'll actually get to the text of Lamentations. All right, Lamentations, it has five chapters. Each of them, as I've mentioned, it's a poem. So you have five separate poems, Each, you know, one chapter per poem. And you have, so you have five poems uh, in, in the book of Lamentations. Each of them is expressing grief over the conquest of Babylon. This is what the focus of it is, I mean, the conquest of Jerusalem, sorry, by the Babylonians in 587, 586. Just this mourning, this outpouring of what has happened to the city. Now, that event, as I said, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare for the people, and it's chilling to read the suffering that occurred there, which is why I wanted you to understand, when you see all that went on, to me, the only reaction is, is what took God so long? That's my reaction. What took God so long to bring this judgment against these people who had treated him the way they treated him? But he finally brings this judgment, and so I, that's why the history, I thought, was so important. He had warned them, urged them, sent people to them, and they just said, listen, we're going to do what we want to do. <laughs> you know, I, I, frankly, I don't care what you want. Yeah, 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 are this stuff. Yeah, I know, Moses, all these things, you know, forget it. We're going to live the way we want to live. And God said, all right, you know, this is, this is it. I have, I have urged, sent prophets, and God finally destroys the city and takes the people captive. Now, the first four poems, they're acrostics, alphabetical poems, which, of course, doesn't come through in a translation. But the Hebrew alphabet, it's, you have 22 uh, letters, in the Hebrew alphabet. Chapters 1, 2, and 4, you each, each of those, uh -huh. chapters 1, 2, and 4, they each have 22 stanzas, which became verses. Okay, 1, 2, and 4, you get 22, 22 letters in the alphabet. One, two, uh, chapters 1, 2, and 4, you have 22 verses. And e the first verse begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Second verse begins with the second letter. You know, just like A, B, C, D, right on down. And that's how, that's how those 1, 2, and 4. Now, chapter 3, it's also an acrostic, but it's a different form. It has 66 stanzas. Okay, so 22 sets of 3. 
Okay, the other is 22 verses. That one has 66 verses. So in that one, what you have is the first three verses are the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The second three verses, the second letter, the third. And so that's the nature of that acrostic. But the first four are acrostics. Now, the fifth one's not an acrostic, but it has 22 verses of one line each. So it's, apparently there's an acknowledgement or an awareness of something of the structure here of being, uh, having the same number of stanzas or verses as there are letters of the alphabet. And you say, well, what's up with the acrostic thing? Uh, don't really know. <laughs> you know, it is speculated. And it, it's just speculated that the form symbolizes completeness. You know, that maybe that's what's behind it, that, that it symbolizes complete, that the, that the poem covers the painful subject, as we would say, from A to Z. Covers the waterfront of the, well, that would make sense, but, you know, it, these kinds of things are just hard to be sure about. You know, that seems to me to be reasonable speculation. Now, what is in, one of the things that's interesting to me is that in the acrostic, the, the uh, acrostics in chapters 2, 3, and 4, Okay, so you have the first four, you, they're, they're, you, they're acrostics. But the acrostics in chapters 2, 3, and 4, the letters ayin and pe in the Hebrew alphabet are reversed from their traditional order that's given in chapter 1. That's kind of odd, isn't it? I mean, you're right. So it'd be like if, we, if you had an acrostic that went a, a through Z, and then you had three following acrostics, and they flipped like M and N. You'd be going, what's up with that? Well, a fellow named Michael Boda, he writes in, in the Dictionary of the Old Testament, Wisdom, Poetry, and Writing, Mark Boda. He says, there's evidence that, that both arrangements of the alphabet were acceptable in Israel at the time. In other words, you had basically that it hadn't solidified so much that it would be impossible to have the reversal. But he then says that makes it impossible to think that the same person wrote chapter 1 as wrote chapters 2, 3, and 4, because chapter 1, the acrostic, follows what, what has become the standard order. Chapters 2, 3, and 4, you have a reversal of the two letters, I, N, and P. But that's not necessarily so. As I was thinking about it, I said, well, it could be that that was a poetic indication of disruption or instability. You see, in other words, if I, if, if I want to convey turmoil and everything's up in the air and out of order, and if it was understood that you have kind of a main thing here, but it was known that these reversals were known, perhaps I would, in a poem, write it this way and then reverse it just as another statement of tumult. Okay, can I prove that? Of course not. <laughs> That's just a thought. But either way, you see this. So this guy, he thinks that, that you have different people writing it, and, and whoever's writing it's inspired. Now, a tradition that predates the first century A.D., predates the New Testament time, attributes the book to the prophet Jeremiah, Lamentations to the prophet Jeremiah. But Lamentations is silent about who wrote it. Okay, so this is simply something that you have a tradition that's, that's fairly old that says, that says that Jeremiah was the one who wrote it, but... Uh, uh, how certain we can be about that. He could have written it, but I don't know that we can be confident of that. And I heard that bell just have just about mm, a few more lines, and then uh, I'm going to stop here. We'll pick that up, and then we're actually getting to the text next week if I'm still alive. Thank you.